Welcome to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. <laughs> Dell challenges the status quo, questions everything, and empowers you to return to your core beliefs to make your life better. If you're ready to hear the truth and get your roadmap to the lifestyle you really want, the next hour will change your life. And now, your host, self-made millionaire, national award-winning investor of the year, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley. Welcome to Del Wamsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Wamsley, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. Today is Tell Del Tuesday, and with us here is a couple that has been a member of Lifestyles since 2012 and have accomplished quite a few results since then. And we're going to get into much of that as we can today. Before we get started, though, I want you to understand that they have an interesting story in that people sometimes, when you look at their situation, you think that, well, my situation is really different because I'm really in a situation that's tougher than most folks. Well, this couple, this family, actually went through some challenges. And we're going to bring them up today just so that you can see that you can make it happen also. So welcome today, Chip and Kelly Simmons. Welcome to the show, guys. Good morning, Joe. Good morning. Hey. So guys, I got I got a, some old news and some new news we want to get out about you. But first, let's, let's do some of the old stuff. I haven't interviewed you guys in a long time. I don't remember the last time. But the thing that stood out in my mind was, Kelly, especially in, in your bio, when you, when you write it up and I read your bio, there's this twinge, and I call it the Dave Ramsey twinge. And what I mean by that is you're sitting in there in this bio saying, I don't understand. Why is it I'm doing what these people are doing? I'm doing real estate, and I'm not making the rates of return that these people are claiming that they're making. Hmm, interesting. Why don't you pick that one up and run with that? Because you guys were Dave Ramsey speakers at one time, actually facilitators at one time, a long time ago. And I know that Dave Ramsey takes people that are broke and helps them get back on their feet. That makes sense. But what is it that you found didn't take you beyond that point? So Dave Ramsey tells us to pay your house off, and we did do that. We moved into the city, and we went ahead and rented that paid-off house. And by doing that, we didn't know a lot about real estate, so we hired a property management company, and they took a bit of a cut. By the end of the day, we're only really making 6% on our money, maybe 5% in some months. So we weren't really moving forward, and we it was 100% paid off. I took my bonuses, and Chip had, took his bonuses. We combined them, and we purchased a duplex, and we started making a little bit of money there. But it would take us years to put together a down payment for our next property, and it just seemed like it was taking forever. And I just didn't understand how people can do multiple properties within one year when we were taking both of our bonuses and extra money throughout the year and putting it on down payment and just barely getting a property once this year. Maybe we'll get one in three or four years. You know, it would just take too long. So that's why we could not move faster, because we did have that Dave Ramsey mentality. So uh, who drug who in? By the way, Chip's a CPA. Kelly, uh, you're a project manager, corporate-wise, when you were working full-time. Who drug who to the Dave Ramsey theories? So, that would be me. <laughs> so, so we kind of each led two different paradigm shifts. The first paradigm shift was, okay, we, we, when we got married, we, we knew we wanted to have a family. We needed to attack the debt that we had. We needed to change the direction of our fiscal responsibility. And I got her to come to the Dave Ramsey program because as an accountant, I'm all about budgets, you know, putting names to numbers and uh, dollars. And she reluctantly went with me to Dave Ramsey, but she drank the Kool-Aid. And we started working on that, the debt that we had. And we really were effective, affected it very quickly. About uh, 15 months, we had done quite a bit of favorable changes to our personal situation. So... That was be, be me. And then she, and I'll let her explain more the, the paradigm into leverage debt. Yeah, so when I went to one of the initial meetings at Lifestyles, I was really excited about it. 
But I always believe that anytime you're doing a huge paradigm shift, the couple needs to go together to understand the concept. It's not that they both have to be involved through step by step throughout the process going forward, but they need to understand that map and that method forward. And so I went to the first lesson and, you know, I really enjoyed it. I thought about it. He said, did you join yet? And I said, no. The next month, y'all had another one. And I went and I really enjoyed the people that were there, the members. And I really got excited. And I said, yes, I came home. I said, we joined. But now we both need to go to this two day to understand the methodology because I thought that was most important. And so I was the one that kind of drug him to do it. I said, we spent the money. Now we need to go. And so we set it up and we went, I think, in May or June back in, in 2012. So Chip is, is an accountant, basically CPA. What aha moment did you pull out of the two day? Because you're looking at it, like you said, as a numbers guy. What did you come away with? One of the biggest things, Dell, was you know, changing the perspective that when you buy a house, you have to go straight for that commercial loan. And you know you got the PMI. You got to deal with that if you don't want to pay for the uh, mortgage insurance. So kind of learning, you know, that hey, there's a different avenue, you know, through the math that you teach. It circumvent kind of the long drawn out process that I would have, without going to um, lifestyles, would have understood how to try to build a real estate portfolio. So there was a big aha moment there. Learning how to you look at a, a depressed value property and then get a hard money and then get an after repair analysis and then then move into a, a, a conventional. That was something that was brand new to me. And it was certainly an aha. That's an interesting step. And that's a, that's a, a fascinating strategy as to how to uh, mitigate what I thought were the long drawn out processes to build a real estate portfolio. Kelly, how about you? What was your aha moment? You know, I really enjoyed the first day with the single families. I thought that's interesting. You know, that could be completely doable. The second day when I showed up, y'all focused on multifamily. And that blew my mind. I was so impressed by it. And I thought, oh, my goodness, is this the route we're going to go? You know, I was just so excited to get home and see what was going to be our strategy and Chip looked at me and said, hey, let's sign up so that we can get into um, multifamily on the road. And I was just super stoked about that. So let's talk now real quick before we go to break so everybody can be on the same page. Since you've started, you've purchased how many single family houses, how many passive investments uh, as far as the number of total units you guys own, because it's quite a few different deals and it's quite a few units. And then we'll get into the fact that you guys also are lead investors in other deals that you're actually running your, yourself. So give us a little quick numbers on that. So we bought and sold several homes. We currently have five single-family homes. I've thought about eliminating them, but we really have really good residents, so it's not a bother to me. So I just let it roll, and I'm about to, uh, I've already signed the paperwork, and I need to wire the money, but we're now in 10 passive deals, and we're syndicating one, which is 204 units. So total 10 passive deals. How many units is that total? Any idea? Oh, gosh. I, you know, I generally don't look at units. I look at, you know, how much we're investing in. And so we really try to focus on, you know, getting a good amount invested in each one of yeah. them. So, yeah, it's about 1,200 1200 units. 1,200 units. Okay, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with Chip and Kelly Simmons in the Del Wamsley Radio Show. Welcome back. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to Del Wamsley Radio Show. With me here today is Chip and Kelly Simmons. And um, 
their story is a great one. They uh, found lifestyles after being a Dave Ramsey follower. They decided to up their game a little bit from just working at one house after another in a very slow process and leverage their way into multiple houses right away and then eventually getting into passive deals and then eventually becoming a lead investor themselves and being a syndicator to syndicate two different apartment complexes. So it's a great story. We're going to hopefully get it all out here today. Kelly, let's pick this up at somewhere along the lines of when did you find out that your company was going to cut you off when you had a a high-risk pregnancy. And the only reason I'm bringing that up is not to get into your personal life, but for people out there that, you know, boom, sometimes life just hits you in the side of the head with a baseball bat, and you've got to, you know, stand on your own two feet and figure out how to get through it. So kind of share that story, if you don't mind, and how you beat that problem. Sure. I don't mind at all because I think getting to know somebody and how they got somewhere You know, it's not always easy to get where you want to go. There are challenges in life, and you have to make decisions to get to that destination. So when I worked for an oil and gas company in in San Antonio for 10 years, and as I was working up the chain, becoming a project manager, uh, looking to be a senior project manager, getting on very good uh, projects, uh, one of the jokes, on Facebook, I, I post a lot of train pictures, and your listeners, if they're on my Facebook, they'll laugh about it, because one of the biggest projects I was on before I got pregnant with my son, uh, who who is Down syndrome, his name is Kyle, he um, had three holes in his heart when, uh, when he was in utero, and I was on a train project for California to face um, that issue um, out there, uh, a software, uh, putting out a new software system. So at the time, I was working really, really hard. I had proposed it uh, the year before. It got approved. It was, you know, I had just started getting my team together who I was going to utilize in California. I was super excited about it. And then I found out I had a high-risk pregnancy, and I was going to the doctor's office very frequently and making sure that he was okay and that we were on track. I was still able to manage my projects, but they were they did not like that. So they took the project away from me. They de- they demoted me to back to a business analyst, but the work that they gave me to do was a business analyst juniors type of work. Um, Menial tasks, they couldn't take away my pay because I had done nothing wrong, uh, but I was pigeonholed. At that point, I knew there was no return, no coming back from this, and I had to do something. I had one foot in real estate, and I was, you know, it would get to a better point. And once I had gotten into lifestyles, which was actually right before I got pregnant, I was learning mode. Uh, I always believe everybody needs to learn first before they jump in. And once I started understanding, and even when I had him in the hospital, I was buying single family homes from the hospital bed. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. <laughs> So that, oh, that I, un- I understand. I bought an apartment complex when I was in the hospital. <laughs> so I, I get you. The The thing that's interesting to me, though, is that eventually you let go of that corporate America job. So you got Chip and you both have great jobs, making good W-2 income, and you elected to let one of them go. Had you built up your passive income at that point when you made that decision? At that point in time, when I always think of built-up passive income, that means it it equals or exceeds my current money income. And at that time, we hadn't done that. However, we knew that we had plenty of savings, because I'm going back to the Dave Ramsey um, paradigm, is that we had no consumer debt, and we were able to save a lot of cash so that when I quit, now I start buying. Now I start moving forward. And... He would be the W-2 where we could buy a house and, you know, refinance it, buy another house and refinance it. So he was, he always says he's my W-2 guy. Gotcha. So when you got going on this, this house situation, you're starting to pull all this together. When did you decide to do passive deals? 
You know, we really like to do passive deals right away. One came up in New Braunfels, and we really enjoyed We really loved it. A lot of that was a big step for us. So we had looked at other ones and, and didn't. It's not that the deal wasn't bad. We just were not ready. And we finally got into that deal. Chip, do you remember what year that was? Uh, that was 2015. So it took us three years to decide to actually go for it in one passive deal before we actually did our first syndication. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that deal. Did they ever uh, build out that commercial space in that building? They've done some work. I haven't been at the meetings lately. Chip, do, have you? I haven't seen it, but yeah, they were doing some office share space and uh, cultivating some profits and some cash flow in that dynamic. Yeah, that, that property's probably gone up quite a bit in value, I would assume, since uh, 2015. Yeah, it's one of those properties where we, we kind of look back, wish we would have put in more, but, you know, that's typical. And uh, it was a good start-off passive property to get into because uh, we could see the fruits of uh, the hard work that the leads were doing and um, kind of the, the distributions that were coming out of it to move, okay, let's do a little bit of our strategy now, and uh, how can we... Um, how can we get more money to invest in passives by tapping the equity that we had in the single family unit that we we were um, uh, we were running and uh, and redeploy that equity that um, we had built up into other passive deals kind of followed that yeah that's an interesting balance when you're sitting there and you you have some money in the bank and you're looking at it in the way that I do this all the time. So it's in my brain constantly. Is it okay? If I take another million or two out of over here and stick it over here, I'm going to make, you know, another $10,000 a month in cash flow. But do I want to take that million or two or do I want to just keep that million or two there? You know, the security of having cash compared to the security of having income. And you know, if you have the cash, eventually you're going to use it up if you don't have enough income to live off of. So that there's that balance that goes back and forth. 10 passive deals. 1,200 units you came up with right before the break. When we come back, let's talk about being a lead investor. We'll take a short break. Be right back with Chip and Kelly Simmons and the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Back. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to Del Wamsley Radio Show. With me here today on Tell Dell Tuesday is Chip and Kelly Simmons out of San Antonio. And uh, we've talked about already today that they've uh, done single family houses. They've done passive deals. They got about 1,200 units in passive deals. And then they decided to go ahead and be lead investors and do their own syndication. So guys, who wants to pick this one up? When did this decision get made? And let me be the fly on the wall. How did it happen? What's interesting is we sat down with Dave Fisher and said, okay, how do we get there from here? And it was probably about the time that we invested in our first apartment complex, because then we started getting the itch at this time. And he said, sell all your houses, and at that time you'll have the money to start syndicating. And that's what we started doing. And then it, it's funny because he goes, okay, I see that Chip does not want to take out of your 401k, so you are going to have to do a few more houses until you can get that money and then go do it. And Chip and I sat down for the next six months working on it, and then we finally decided as a family that, yes, we're going to go ahead and take the money out of 401k. We moved it into cash at the end of 2015, and then in and when I say cash, it's still under the umbrella of 401k because we we're going to get um, a tax hickey. And in 2016, that's when we pulled it out and we found this apartment, and it was a hail of a day. Which one was that? The small one, the first one, or the second one? The the first one. It was Wood Lake, and we had purchased it in 2016. And anybody that lives in San Antonio in April 12th of that year, they probably got a brand new roof because majority of San Antonio did. So this was a funny, 
Go ahead. Real funny part of this story is that when we decide, okay, let's pull the four hundred one k, let's strategically do it by you know early in the year. Let's get a, a property that we purchase early in the year, try to have as much in, uh, depreciation to offset the income tax from the distribution. Not much we can do with the penalty, but we we cut that check. We thought, well, let's you know let's just jump right into the deep end. Uh, let's move into the shallow end like we had with single family. And well, what, it, what ended up happening is Kelly buys a deep value play that, you know, I, I trusted her. I, you know, she did such a great job with uh, the single family uh, real estate portfolio that yeah, we went after it and uh, we bought it, got it under contract. And then a hailstorm comes through and just tore it all up. And she still wanted to stick with it. She had a vision. And, you know, I tell you what, uh, I believed in her, and I'm glad I did. You know, my, my future self today looks back and says, that was a brilliant idea, <laughs> what she did with the, the apartment complex. Had nothing to do with the 315% return that she made on the deal, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that kicks in, too, as well. But you know, back then at that time, I thought we could get out of that contract. I'm so glad we didn't. And we listened to – we took her path forward. So the um – the the hail came before you guys closed, obviously, and then you guys had to negotiate to get the insurance given to you after closing or during closing, or how'd that work? So a week prior to closing, we had the hail storm, and the next day we didn't know that it affected how bad it affected San Antonio. Uh, Chip yelled at me. He said, "Come here, get in here. You know we're on the news. Is this our apartment that we're buying? Can we get out?" Can we get out of the contract? <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, that's our apartment. Chip, you're and a man of my uh, own heart. Mr. Negativity, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Drop the mic Goodbye. and walk away. It's done. I, I was wrong. I will admit it. I was wrong. I told him, I said, no, no, let's let's step back here a second. Let's uh, evaluate it. Let's see what's going on. You know, see what we could do to save this deal. Uh, Dave Fisher had called me that evening and told me, you need to hire a public adjuster. Here's his name and phone number. He's expecting you to call him tonight. And this is 8 o'clock in the, at night, the very next night. And so I called the public adjuster. I had to spend another month. Um, we, we had to wait another month to get all the attorneys involved. But until we had an ironclad contract in place that the insurance would be given to us, then we were able to close. And at that point in time, that's when the fun started. <laughs> so real quick, real quick with your, for your listeners, a public adjuster comes in. He's the advocate for the claimant. So we, we, we made the claim on the, uh, on the property, and the insurance company came in and offered us a certain amount of money. We hired a public adjuster to come in because they know the, the lingo, the language, everything within the insurance industry, and they were our advocate, and they fought for a higher dollar payout on the insurance claim, and I believe that that public adjuster got us an additional eighty to $90,000 on that claim. Uh, so it was a, uh, another, again, brilliant move to bring in the public adjuster. So that's how you make lemonade out of lemons, right? Correct. That's right. All right. So let's talk about what you guys did to make this thing go up in value 315%. Let's talk about that. Tell you your operations so, on this. So what, what I did was we already knew it was a deep value play. And then after the hail storm, it really made it a deep, deep value play. Plan was where there was carpet, which was the bedrooms, we would put vinyl plank you know, bedrooms in the living room. Um, everywhere else, we're going to keep it the same. You know, there was a few other amenities that we added later on because of the hailstorm that we weren't planning to do. But because we're able to have that extra money, we went ahead and do vinyl plank throughout, which gave it a better value. And it really enhanced a lot of people. We add railings to the porches. We... We added a playground, which was not in the budget, but we had it now because of the insurance. We had a brand new roof. Uh, but when we initially took it over, there was 35 windows broken out, five sliding glass doors. One of the buildings, the roof had collapsed in it. 
And so there was just a lot of work to be done. And we first initially had to secure the residents, secure the property, and then start being able to fix and rehab at that point in time. Let's talk about rent increases. From the time you bought it, where were the rents at? And where did you move them to? And how many moves did it take to get there? So initially, because we were ugly as a dog, we were still boarded up. It was hard to get glass. We, it was hard to get roofers to even come out and bid because every roofer was in town and you need to get a reputable one. We initially had average rents about 500, 600. And then I think we averaged going all the way up. Our lit, last one was a three bedroom. It was renting initially for 799. And then we, when we left and we sold it, it was at 1295. Wow. That's amazing. And that was because we had six. It was actually a 2-2 loft at the time. And we noticed that if we close up that loft area, that could be the third bedroom. And we needed to add a closet and a door to it. And so that's what we did is we made that a three bedroom because we had to rehab it anyway. All of the lofts were destroyed 100% inside. And so we were able just to gut those and just make them three bedrooms. And it really worked out in our favor. Good move. Real good move. So you had quite a bit of rent increase there. And um, what triggered you to want to move on and sell this one? So I always look at properties and you can bump rent so much. And then it starts to level off. And in my head, I kind of think of it as apartment flipping, but it really truly isn't. You take an ugly apartment, you spend a lot of effort, a lot of time. I myself consider myself as the rehab manager. I don't just hire a company just to go in and tell them do this. When I had the roofers come, before I paid them, I inspected every bit of that roof. I walked it even though I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> and so those are the types of things that I do. I had a, uh, one of my friends, I said, hey, can you get me up to the second roof? Because I'm very scared. <laughs> and so but we walked it because, you know, is the decking good? Did they replace the decking where needed? Um, there was a lot of things that I had to make sure that was done, if the flashing was done correctly. Or, well, I'm gonna, what know. I have to do now is take us out to break, so I'm sorry to cut you off. We'll be right back with Kelly and Chip Simmons and the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. With me here today on Tell Dell Tuesday is Chip and Kelly Simmons out of San Antonio. Um, their story, if you've been following around or if you just tuned in right now, is that they bought a bunch of single family houses, then they went on and bought some passive apartment complexes, and then they went on and syndicated. And the last deal we were talking about as we went to break was a 55 unit that they got a 315% rate of return on. And they got cut off as we were going to break. You were talking about rehab. And go ahead and pick that up and don't fall off the roof as you're telling the story. So I would, I would go on the roof and make sure everything's done. I would ensure all the rehab was done. At the end of the day, our motto is building a better community. And that's what I really enjoy. I, I get bored on your place. So once we got it established, there wasn't anything for me to do. Um, my staff was running well. We had it at an average for the last two years before we sold it. 97 percent occupied so i wanted to try something new i took some time off and then i tried something new and purchased horizon which is my next um, apartment that i'm rehabbing and making it a better community now this is a much larger project this one is 204 units and where is it located at is this in san antonio also that's correct. I prefer, because I have a family and little ones, I prefer to have my apartments real close to me so that I can be on site because I am overseeing the construction of it. 
Okay, so basically project manager, that's what you do, that's who you are. You're a project manager by nature and by education. And so you're taking on these projects. And it's interesting because when you make the statement, I've got to stay busy, there are people like that. I, I mean, I get it. To just If you had nothing to do, you would go crazy. You have to have something to do. But for you, you've got three kids, a husband, a home, a bunch of single family houses, and you need something else just to keep you busy. That's interesting. So with multifamily or real estate in general, you choose your hours to work or what you want to focus on. My kids are in school all day long. So I could do gardening, which I enjoy doing too, but that's only so much time. And so I do that during the day, and then I used to pick them up from school, but now we have retired Chip out of the W-2 world as well, and now all he does is he, you know, does a small book of business that he prefers, and, um, you know, he picks up the kids, and we spend the afternoon together with the family. Wow, Chip, you turned into a house dad, huh? Uh, it's, it's crazy, Dell. Crazy. I've never experienced anything <laughs> like this. But, uh, you know, I, I'm spending more time with my kids, and I love it. You know, pick them up after school, and if we want to go have an ice cream, we'll go have an ice cream. And uh, uh, I'm away from that, you know, the, the desk that wouldn't let me leave uh, and the employer that wouldn't let me go when I, when I needed to, you know. or is just All that headache is gone. And, you know, we've retired. First, we retired Kelly, and we worked the map and the strategy, and we've retired me now. And uh, it's freed me up. And, you know, it's freed me up to help Kelly. I'll do the, the family finances, and now she can focus really as a project manager on this new property. Wow, what a great story. Is there any way you can even share with anybody how different it is to be coming out of that accounting mentality? And in, in, Basically, I was an accountant by by trade or by education. Let's call it by education. My dad was a CPA by education and by job title. So when I was doing accounting, I've always found that you could always find more stuff to do. I don't know why, yeah. but yeah. you can always find more stuff to do. And when I let it all go and I'm just sitting around the house now and I go like, okay, what are we going to do today, honey? Pretty weird feeling, it, huh? You know, I'm still acclimating to it, but it, it is, you know, uh, I've been in public accounting. I've done a lot of tax work. I've been as a CFO for the last 13 years. And, you know, you just get into that. I've got more things to do than I have time to get them done, it seems. And when you move out of that rat race, that executive or that desk job that you're chained to, it seems like at times, it's hard. Trust me, this isn't hard. I am acclimating well, I think. And uh, it, it is, it's been fantastic. And uh, we, you know, we worked really hard. We had, a, I think, a very good strategy. Kelly, as a project manager, is really well, does really well with this type of stuff. And me, as a W-2, we kind of, that's kind of how, what we've been working for the last eight years. And, you know, where we are, it's from, you know, working a map that you provided. And I think it's been fantastic. And we really appreciate it. One last question. We've only got a minute left. Take this however you want to take it and divide it up. But the bottom line is, you were Dave Ramsey Advocates and also, at some point, you guys helped out with that program. So you had to have touched a lot of people. What do you do now when you see those people and tell them, hey, I just went and got in debt and got retired? I mean, does that blow their minds? I think a lot has to do with we taught people we didn't even know. We would go into businesses and teach it. And when we had started in Lifestyles, I had one more gig that I had, signed up, had contracted with them for. And I felt really bad talking to them about 401K when, you know, Chip and I had been discussing, let's pull out of our 401K and get into real estate. And at that point in time, I couldn't do it no more. I was done because it went against my beliefs. I, my belief system changed, and there was no way I need to be telling somebody something that I didn't believe in anymore. I get it. I totally get it. So you guys going to be at the Expo in September? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We'll be there. Yeah, we're looking ah, forward to it. 
great. Then I get to see you again. Haven't seen, you know, we haven't seen anybody in the last year, right? Now we get to go back out and see all of our friends again. That's going to be a great time. So look forward to yeah, that. Right. Guys, thanks for coming on today and telling your story again. Um, keep up with this great work you're working on, Kelly. Get this next project done. And everybody out there, remember this. They're not doing this for some money. They're doing it for an incredible lifestyle. Have a great day. The information and opinions you hear on the Del Wamsley Radio Show are those of the host, Del Wamsley, his guests, and his callers, and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this station, its affiliates, its management, or advertisers. The Del Wamsley Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Del Wamsley Show constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.